Good evening and welcome to our, ED, our annual Edie Edelman Political Awareness Event. My name is Diane Zoll and I'm the Director of Women's Philanthropy at the Milwaukee Jewish Federation. It is my pleasure to introduce Cheryl Mosier, our dedicated Women's Philanthropy mm -hmm. President. Mm -hmm. Cheryl. Thank you, Diane. As President of Women's Philanthropy, I would also like to welcome everyone to our annual Edie Edelman Political Awareness Event and thank you for joining us. As we learned during this event, we also think of our brothers and sisters living in the Ukraine, and we are wishing them peace and a quick resolution to this conflict. Women's Philanthropy is a proud, proud to host the Edie Edelman Political Awareness Event for our community each year. We're excited to have this opportunity to learn and grow together. I would like to thank this year's co-chairs, Tamar Kelber and Jody habish Sinekin. This event is made possible by the Edie Edelman Political Awareness Endowment Fund at the Jewish Community Foundation of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation. Edith, best known as Edie, was a very special woman who has left a great impact on our community. Edie was a philanthropist and a community leader in the Milwaukee Jewish community. She made a lifelong commitment to activism and to the education of Jewish women. We are pleased that Judge Lynn Edelman, Edie's son, and his wife Betty are able to join us this evening as we can continue to fulfill Edie's mission and commitment, both to the empowerment of women and the responsibility all of us have to be informed citizens. Welcome Judge Edelman and Betty. As a philanthropist, Edie understood the power of a legacy gift like an endowment. She knew that establishing this kind of fund can support a cause that's close to one's heart forever. This fund ensures that Edie's vision and commitment will live on in her name and that the Jewish women of Milwaukee will continue to have access to some of our greatest thinkers in the area of political awareness. It is my honor to introduce Joan Lubar, Milwaukee Jewish Federation's board chair, and Miriam Rosenzweig, Milwaukee Jewish Federation's president and CEO. They're going to get to share some Jewish thoughts and lessons. Miriam and Joan. Thank you, Cheryl. My name is Joan Lubar, and on behalf of the board of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation, I would like to congratulate Women's Philanthropy, and especially our event board chairs, Jody habish Sinekin and Tamar Kelber, for bringing us all together tonight. I also would like to thank the Edelman family. We are so grateful for Edie's dedication and vision. And we are honored to have Judge Edelman and his wife, Betty, here with us tonight. Edie Edelman was a woman of action and believed that political awareness was a Jewish notion. Tonight, we honor her legacy. The Milwaukee Jewish Federation is apolitical, and we are guided by Jewish principles and values. So to prepare for our Devar Torah, Miriam and I turned to our Jewish texts and looked at how our sages viewed voting. It was such a pleasure and so enlightening to study with Miriam, who is quite knowledgeable and learned in all things Torah. So we, we, our first text came from Pirkei Avot, in which Rabbi Hillel taught us, Al tifrosh min hatzibur, do not separate yourselves from the community. And he added that it is our responsibility to play an active role in the community. Here, Rabbi Hillel establishes that each of us and the larger group are one. That is a compelling case for being involved in community. And as a federation, we are rooted in the notion of communal responsibility. But where is the connection to voting? For that, I'd like to turn this over to our CEO, Siriam, <laughs> CEO Miriam Rosenzweig, to share our learning journey. Thank you, Joan. I also love studying with you, and I recommend that everyone who has 
a lay chair partner, get the opportunity to sit and study together and wrestle with the text. So as we studied, we asked again, where can we find a text about voting? We begin to see a conversation about the responsibilities of Jewish citizens as the Jewish Communities Center moves to the diaspora and we are dispersed and no longer in biblical Israel. First, we learned that the duty to create and support government is one of the few duties that Jewish law recognizes for all, Jewish and non-Jew alike. Our sages speak very clearly about the importance of the connection to the leadership where we reside. Rabbi Mayer, who was from France in the 11th century, specified that Jews are obligated to honor the realm's civil laws in exchange for the realm's benefits and protection. He is very clear. You can't expect to benefit from the protection of a realm without adhering and respecting its laws. So now we have a source about citizenships and enjoying the benefits of protection, but is there more? Maimonides from Spain, a contemporary of Rabbi Meir, goes even further. And he says that we are obligated to honor the realm, not only for protection, but to ensure a purpose that includes all social welfare. My paper stuff, I'm sorry. It includes all social welfare for its people. While in the Talmud's day, the main concerns for collective actions were disaster control, military defense, plague, etc. What falls under protection and now recognized by Maimonides is that the modern government, even a thousand years ago, are responsible for the social welfare of its people. Maimonides is continuously teaching us that as Jews, we are obligated to care and to be responsible for social welfare. What is more relevant to us as a Jewish community than to ensure that like the Rambam told us, social issues are Jewish issues. The implications are profound. Most pundits describe the so-called Jewish vote in terms of Israel and the Mideast policy. But our sages say the government's effectiveness to perform its public duties is the Jewish issue. Understood properly, government's whole agenda, public health and safety, social policy, criminal justice, environmental protection, and more is a Jewish issue. All are necessary concerns of Jewish voters as Jewish voters. This leads us to tonight's conversation. If participating in governments to ensure public welfare is a Jewish notion, for Jews and non-Jews alike, then tonight's topic about voting rights is a fundamental right as a citizen is very relevant and very Jewish. Joan? Joan, you're muted. Someone muted me. <laughs> is that a message? <laughs> Um, anyway, we wanted to end our Dvar Torah where we started with Rabbi Hillel's teachings. Do not separate yourselves from the community and our understanding of the collective responsibility to play an active role in ensuring social welfare to all citizens. What we did not find in our learning was a directive to vote for a specific person or party. Instead, if asked, each of us to do our best for the greater good. As the Jewish community, we know this and we live it every day. But today we are living in the most divisive political atmosphere of our lifetimes. The goal of tonight's Edie Edelman political awareness event is to heighten our understanding of the issues surrounding voting rights. Our women's philanthropy team has briefed our speaker who is a expert in this subject matter to share in a nonpartisan manner. Because as I mentioned earlier, Milwaukee Jewish Federation is committed to our apolitical agenda. Regardless of each of our political leanings, whether right or left, conservative, progressive, or somewhere in the middle, we are still one community. It is all of us here in this Zoom room to get tonight it's our friends and families and all Jews locally here and in the diaspora, one community. And as one community, voting rights and voting are in the best interest to create a better society 
and it is a clear Talmudic mandate to vote. Tonight and always, let's learn from each other and never let our political leanings divide us. So with that, I would like to turn this over to our incredible co-chairs for this event, Jody Habish-Sinekin and Tamar Kelber. Thank you. Thank you, Joan and Miriam, for those thoughtful remarks. And hello, everyone. I am Jody Havish Sinekin, and together with my co-chair, Tamar Kelber, I have the honor of introducing the keynote speaker of tonight's program, Attorney Jeff Mandel. As you will hear for yourself, Jeff is an active and prominent figure in Wisconsin's political realm, not as a politician, but as a legal champion of the political processes at the heart of our democracy. I personally have been following the outstanding efforts of Jeff and his partners at Law Forward for some time and feel sincerely grateful for tonight's opportunity to learn more from him firsthand. Before proceeding, we again wish to underscore that tonight's discussion will focus on the integrity of America's political institutions, the defense of which is not a partisan issue. Indeed, our right to vote, right to fair representation, and right to fraud-free elections are all fundamental to our nation's democracy, irrespective of partisan politics. Given daily headlines here in Wisconsin, I can think of no better time for us to hear Jeff's perspectives from the front lines of his litigation work. Knowledge is power. So now let us sit back and gain a richer understanding of the political times in which we live. Tomorrow, I am officially passing the baton to you to share a bit about Jeff's background and qualifications. Thanks. Thanks, Jody. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Jeff Mandel. A native of Central Florida, Jeff graduated from the University of Chicago Law School and worked as a litigator in both Chicago and Washington, DC, before he and his wife, Sarah, realized that Wisconsin was the best place to raise a family. Jeff, Sarah, and their two children live in Madison, where Jeff serves on the board of his synagogue, Beth Israel Center. Jeff heads the appellate, practice, appellate and election law practice teams at Stafford Rosenbaum. He's appeared frequently in election litigation, for example, representing Disability Rights Wisconsin on behalf of indefinitely confined voters and appearing before the Wisconsin Election Committee when Kanye West was trying to get on the presidential ballot. In 2020, he founded Law Forward, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting clean, clean and open government through impacts litigation. My personal favorite of Jeff's professional accomplishments is that he once appeared on the NPR show, This American Life where none other than Ira Glass compared him to a young John Favreau. If you have questions for Jeff, please submit them to me and Jody in the chat. We'll address as many as we can at the conclusion of the talk. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you to Jody and Tamar. Thank you to Diane and Cheryl and to Miriam and to Joan and to everyone else who's helped put this together. It is a pleasure and an honor to be with you tonight. I wanna start quickly and talk about the, just the tremendous honor of being mentioned in the same sentence as the Edelman family. Um, and, and let me step away from the Edelman family for a second and come back. When I first started law school at the University of Chicago, my wife and I went to Rosh Hashanah services on the south side of Chicago, and we walked in a little bit late because sometimes that's what Jews do. And there was a gentleman speaking from the Bema very briefly, maybe 90 seconds, with such profound prophetic voice that I was immediately taken and wanted to know who it was. It turned out to be retired Judge Abner Mikva. Judge Mikva is someone who I had the pleasure to get to know while I was a law student. And he was just a tremendous figure. He served in Congress. He served as a noted judge. He served in the White House and advised key leaders. What I've discovered over the past few years 
is that Judge Lynn Edelman is really the equivalent of Ab Mikvah in almost every way. It's just that because he does it on the smaller stage of Wisconsin, rather than from Chicago, uh, people don't pay quite as much attention. Judge Edelman has been a mentor, a friend, a consultant, and has been one of the most generous supporters to me as a new entrant to Wisconsin's legal community that one could ever want. And it is for that reason that though I never had the pleasure of meeting E.D. Edelman, that I was so overwhelmed uh, when I first got the call from the Federation asking if I would be willing to speak this evening. I want to, before I get into the details, I also want to touch on a couple of things that, that have already been said. The note that, that Edie Edelman believed that political action was a Jewish value could not be something, I couldn't agree with anything more. I was raised that way. Um, my own Jewish values and practice reinforced that. And the idea that the Talmud teach us is, teaches us that it is the government's effectiveness to perform its duties, that that itself is a Jewish value, something we as Jews, as a Jewish community that we care about and we promote is exactly right. Government is not a horse race in a political contest. Government is not a fight or a struggle. Government is what we do together as a country, as a series of communities to take care of each other and make our society work. Um, I'm kind of fascinated by the description and taken with it that I am a legal champion of the political processes underneath our government, because I think that's exactly right. Law forward, like, like the Federation, is nonprofit, is nonpartisan. The work that we do, my colleagues and I, is about making sure that Wisconsin government works and meets its promises to its people. And I would suggest to you that that is profoundly Jewish. Even in these um, strident times, when the work of government, the concept of government, the idea of representative democracy is perhaps more challenged in this country, more contested than it's been in 150 years. Um, I think it's profoundly Jewish to stand up for those values. Our tradition teaches chazak ve'ematz, right? The, 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 the charge that was given to Joshua, to be strong and to be courageous, to lead with passion and wisdom for the things you believe in. And one of the things I think about a great deal is the textual injunction Right, that we are not expected to complete the work, but neither are we free to sit it out entirely. Lo alecha alecha more. That really, at base, is part of what attracts me to the law, and it's what attracts me to the concept of democracy and governance. It is a collective endeavor that each of us can contribute to, but none of us, no matter how high an office you're elected to, no matter what role you play, can do it alone. Let me give a quick sweep of the kind of democracy work that we're doing in Wisconsin right now, and then I want to focus particularly on, on, on one piece of that tonight. There are just overwhelming challenges to democracy in Wisconsin. Law Forward is focused on litigation around our centennial redistricting and making sure that there are fair districts so that our democracy works, so that our voters get to choose their representatives rather than our representatives choosing who gets to vote for them. We're focused on protecting the right to vote and standing up for fair election administration 
two related concepts that are both much more contested now than they have been in general terms, perhaps ever in our nation's history. We work on defending the proper operation of government, the separation of powers that underlies our system of government, and on seeking accountability for those who interfere with these basic processes. And it's that last piece, accountability, that I wanna talk about tonight. Let me step back and, and, and do a quick schoolhouse rock civics piece here to make sure we all start on the same page. Every four years in this country, we have a presidential election. And most of us, if we're asked who we're voting for, we choose a candidate, right? I'm voting for this person to be president, but we're not really. If you remember back to your civics class, the president is chosen by the electoral college. And so the way it works is that you are voting when you go into the cast your ballot, whether from home or at your polling place, in November of every fourth year, you are voting for the electors who will represent the candidate you're choosing here in Wisconsin. Those slates of electors are set in advance, provided by each campaign, whatever candidate you choose, major party, minor party, those electors have been named in advance. And the electors, after all the votes are cast, after the process, has largely concluded, hopefully uneventfully, but not always. The electors meet in the state capitol on a certain day at noon. It's all set out in the statutes. And that is the electoral college. It happens in all 50 states on the same date. And they fill out papers that reflect the votes for each of their states and they send them to Washington. And then, in January of the new year, after the new Congress is sworn in, but before the president is inaugurated, the Congress meets and counts all of those pieces of paper, all of those electoral votes. And that is how we elect presidents in this country. But in 2020, the system was challenged and almost toppled for the first time in about 150 years. This is not an issue of partisanship. It's an issue of our democratic institutions and our history of the peaceful transition of power. I wanna to touch on that peaceful transition of power piece for a minute. Just two days ago, we celebrated President's Day. And just yesterday was George Washington's birthday. We often overlook, we talk about Washington because he was the first president, but that's not the only reason we talk about Washington. We talk about Washington because he voluntarily surrendered power. He peacefully turned over power over, the, over our government to the next person who had been chosen by the will of the public. That's a really remarkable thing and, and, and we take it for granted these days. But what we've learned in the last couple of years is that we shouldn't take it for granted. And if you think, if, if, for all of you who saw Hamilton, Right? There's that moment where King George says, you can do that? Like you, you can just let someone else be president, not someone who's related to you, not try to keep it for yourself. You can just turn it over to someone else. This was a remarkable and innovative concept. And that is a tremendous part of what we commemorate on President's Day. That peaceful transition of power is part of what Ronald Reagan talked about as America being a shining city on a hill. It's part of what our tradition talks about when we think as American Jews, what is it that makes our community, what is it that makes our nation a light unto the nations and Orla Goim? This is a huge part of it. If you think about all the nations in the world that talk about aspiring to be more like America, this is a tremendous piece of what they have in mind. But our democracy is fragile. 
It always has been, and it remains so. And I would suggest to you it is more fragile than we thought. Lincoln, the other president born in February, who we really commemorate on President's Day, spoke openly and took tremendous risks to meet the obligation to ensure that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Shall not perish from the earth. He knew it could. He stared that down. There are many who would draw from the last several years of our history a positive lesson, who would tell you that the institutional pillars of our democracy held fast. I'd like to suggest to you tonight a slightly different view. And I apologize if it's a little bit less sunny. But the institutional pillars of our democracy were more vulnerable to challenge. They changed more and they came closer to collapsing than most of us would have dreamed possible within so short a time. One of the things that strikes me is that within the last 20 years, our nation was heavily engaged in the concept, and, and to some extent still is, of nation building around the world. And there may well be people in our Zoom room tonight who have strongly different opinions about the wisdom of that. But the idea was that if we could plant democratic institutions in societies where democracy had never taken hold, that we could leave and those institutions would of their own accord grow and flower. That theory has tremendous appeal. As Americans who enjoy those institutions, who consider them part of our birthright, who take them for granted, there's something lovely about the idea that we could share that with others. But our institutions, I would suggest to you, have proven to be much more shallowly rooted than we expected, even after 240 years of those institutions. It's hard to conceive of how we build a lasting democracy in a short time. If anything, what recent history, both here and abroad, teaches is how much easier it is to dismantle and to destroy than it is to build, especially with respect to democracy. So what is it that happened in 2020 that I wanna talk about? We had here in Wisconsin a close election. I think we all know that, but it was not a razor thin one. In fact, we've had numerous closer elections. The margin in our 2020 presidential election in Wisconsin was 20,682 votes out of about 3.3 million. But in 2004, in the presidential race, the margin in Wisconsin was only 11,384 votes out of 3 million. And in 2000, in the presidential election, the margin in Wisconsin was 5,708 votes out of 2.5 million. But for the butterfly ballot and the hanging chads in Palm Beach County, the entire world and all the focus of the contested 2000 presidential election would have been here in Wisconsin. It's not just presidential elections. In 2019, we had an election for the Supreme Court of Wisconsin. Those are nonpartisan elections where the margin was 5,981 votes out of one and a quarter million. In 2018, the margin for the attorney general's race was only 17,190 votes out of 2.6 million. The governor's election was just slightly larger than the 2020 presidential margin. And in 2011, we had another Supreme Court election where the margin was 7,006 votes out of one and a half million. Wisconsin is a place where we have close elections. Um, our current attorney general described his, his uh, 0.5% margin in, in 2018 as a, as a Wisconsin landslide. But what changed in 2020, what made that close 2020 presidential election differ from the others is that the losing candidate 
and losing campaign did not want to accept the results and refused to do so. There were challenges to the rules, the basic ground rules of the election, but those challenges were raised only after the fact and without ever acknowledging that most of those same rules had been in place for 2016 when the same campaign accepted them, profited by them and made no complaint when it came out on top in an election that was essentially just as close. That campaign, as it was entitled to by law, sought a recount in Wisconsin and then challenged the results of that recount through st state courts. That campaign also brought its own separate court challenges from the recount, both in the Wisconsin Supreme Court and in federal court in Milwaukee. That campaign also worked with its allies to bring a variety of challenges in a variety of courts across Wisconsin, all over the country. There were several cases brought by a lawyer named Sidney Powell across the country, including one in Wisconsin. There were a, a whole bevy of challenges in the Wisconsin Supreme Court right around Thanksgiving. The state of Texas took a challenge directly to the United States Supreme Court, trying to have Wisconsin and a couple of other states votes thrown out entirely. And there were a number of other cases in federal courts around the nation, including challenges to the results in Wisconsin that were brought in federal courts in New York, in Colorado, and the District of Columbia. But by noon on December 14th, that was the day in 2020 the Electoral College was meeting. By noon on December 14th, all the court challenges had been decided. The courts, for what it's worth, had gone to tremendous lengths to make sure that that happened. The Supreme Court of Wisconsin, and for those of you who aren't lawyers, this, you might not realize quite how unusual this is, but the Supreme Court of Wisconsin accepted the appeal from the recount on Friday afternoon, December uh, 11th, I believe, if I'm counting correctly, or 10th, ordered both parties within a number of hours not a day, within six or seven hours to file simultaneous briefs. They didn't even get to read each other's and respond. Simultaneous briefs on Friday night about the recount. Then the court held a rare, perhaps unprecedented oral argument on Saturday morning. And then not even two days later, on Monday morning, the court released its opinion a couple of hours before the Electoral College was meeting. The electors for the winning campaign did what has always happened here in Wisconsin. They held a public meeting. It was in the governor's conference room where it is held by tradition, regardless of the party holding the governor's mansion, regardless of the party that wins the presidential election. It was noticed publicly in advance it was broadcast on Wisconsin Eye, which many of you know is our sort of uh, C-SPAN equivalent here. And it completed the necessary paperwork and sent it to all of the proper officials. The electors who were on the slate for the losing campaign did something unprecedented. They held a secret meeting. They were somewhere else in the Capitol. They did so without public notice without broadcast, and really without even acknowledging what they were doing. They completed fake paperwork designed to appear real in every respect. I'm gonna come back to that. And they sent that paperwork to the same officials that it would go to if it were real. These papers I would suggest to you were a deliberate effort to defraud to defraud every single one of the 3.3 million Wisconsinites who turned out to vote and who turned out to vote in good faith that their vote would matter, that their vote would contribute to determining the next president of the United States. I know that it is a strong claim to say that this is an effort to defraud. So let me be a little bit more specific. 
These papers, these 10 individuals claim to be, quote, the duly elected and qualified electors from the state of Wisconsin, end quote. That is false. These papers and these 10 individuals claim to convey, quote, Wisconsin's electoral votes for president and vice president. They do not. That is false. These papers and these individuals claim that the, that the electors, quote, convened and organized to perform the duties enjoined upon us, end quote. Enjoined upon us, imposed by law. But because they weren't the duly elected and qualified electors, no duties were imposed upon them, except really not to do this. This is false. In every possible respect, these papers mimic the valid papers. They do not contain language. And I wanna be clear because this didn't happen just in Wisconsin. There are seven states where this happened. But in two of those states, things are very different. And I would suggest that while the electors for the losing candidate who met in those, seven, in those other two states did something that is undemocratic, something that we really would not like to see happen again. I don't think it was fraudulent, and here's why. In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, at the top of the papers, those fake electors wrote, quote, that their votes would count, quote, if as a result of a final non-appealable court order or other proceeding prescribed by law, we are ultimately recognized as being the duly elected and qualified electors. In other words, they told anyone who looked at those papers, hey, you know, we might not currently be the electors, but we think maybe later we could be. And it's, it's almost like an in case of emergency break glass piece. There's nothing like that on the Wisconsin papers. In the state of New Mexico, the papers say that they were, they were created, quote, on the understanding that it might later be determined that we are the duly elected and qualified electors. Same idea. It makes clear that they are not, as the Wisconsin electors claim to be, already the duly elected and qualified electors. And so what happened in Wisconsin, unfortunately, is much more similar to the efforts in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, and Nevada. The fraudulent electors and the papers that they submitted to Congress created the conditions that were necessary for the January 6th insurrection. The rioters in Washington were there to urge the adoption of the false slates of electors that were submitted by these five states. Without those slates of electors, without those papers, there would have been no concrete demand for action. There would have been nothing they were asking the Congress to do. There would have been no reason to storm the Capitol. So what is it that we should do about this? I would suggest we need to find accountability through formal challenge, through formal channels. We need to ensure that this never happens again. So what is Law Forward doing about this? We're seeking civil accountability through a declaration by the Wisconsin Elections Commission that the conduct undertaken by the fraudulent electors was indeed illegal and contrary to Wisconsin law. Second, we're seeking criminal accountability for state offenses through our district attorneys and the Wisconsin Department of Justice. I can give you at least eight state felony statutes that I think were violated here, including forgery, falsely assuming to act as a public officer, simulating legal process, misconduct while assuming to act in public office, conspiracy to commit criminal acts, and we could go on. And third, we're seeking ethics accountability through the Office of Lawyer Regulation for the one elector who is a licensed lawyer. I, I will note parenthetically that it is shocking to me that there are two fraudulent electors in Wisconsin who are public officials, but are not lawyers. 
And as best we can tell, they face no formal ethics investigation or violation because under Wisconsin law, a public official violates our ethics rules only if they commit a crime and they haven't been convicted of anything yet, they haven't been charged with anything yet, or if they take an action for their own pecuniary benefit. And to our knowledge, there was no pecuniary benefit here. I wanna note that, that our actions to seek accountability are not the only ones. The January 6th special committee in Congress has subpoenaed two of the fraudulent electors, the chair and the secretary. And the United States Department of Justice is reportedly investigating whether there are federal crimes here. And I would suggest there probably are additional crimes under federal law, but that that has no bearing on whether there are state crimes. Uh, the federal government should investigate federal crimes and the state and local governments should investigate state crimes. I would also suggest to you that we need, in addition to these formal channels of accountability, we need to impose some societal accountability. There should be no room in our civic life for people who attempt to hijack our democracy. Now, we should be careful, again, not to cast this as a partisan issue. All citizens have an interest in free and fair elections, and partisanship should not be used to distract us from the fundamental value of promoting those free and fair elections. I wanna note just a couple, well, more than a couple, a handful of the fraudulent electors and the way that their participation in our civic life continues in ways that I at least would suggest to you are problematic. Bob Spindell is one of the fraudulent electors. He is also an appointed member of the Wisconsin Elections Commission. In fact, he was reappointed for a new five-year term on that commission since his role as a fraudulent elector became public. And it appears that in our complaint to the Wisconsin Elections Commission that we want a declaration that this was illegal, he doesn't even wanna recuse himself. Though it is an elementary piece of fair justice under American legal ideas, under biblical legal ideas, that you can't be the judge of your own case. Our Senate Majority Leader who appointed Mr. Spindell to the Elections Commission has completely brushed aside any requests to replace him. Andrew Hitt, another fraudulent elector, in fact, the chairman of the fraudulent electors, continues to work at one of Wisconsin's most prominent law firms. And he's also chairing the campaign of a major candidate seeking to be the next attorney general. Think about that. This is someone who openly violated Wisconsin law and is running the campaign and was chosen to run the campaign of the person who would like to be our chief law enforcement officer. Kelly Rue, also subpoenaed by the January 6th committee because she was the secretary of the fraudulent electors, continues to serve on the city council in the city of De Pere in Brown County. She's actually uh, up for re-election uh, in April. And Bill Feehan in Southwest Wisconsin continues to serve in a leadership role on a major gubernatorial campaign. He's on the steering committee of one of the leading campaigns of a candidate for governor. Let me end by explaining why I think accountability is so important in this instance. When this first happened, when it first came out that these folks had met sort of lurking in dark shadows of the Capitol, it seemed to me like the last throes of what was essentially a lawless campaign. And it seemed like it was going to be the most egregious example that we were going to see. But as time has passed, that has proven incorrect. Things, tactics, efforts to press and break the law have continued to escalate and metastasize, challenging and threatening our democracy. If we value our democracy, if we want it to function as a battle of ideas, 
between people with different policy goals, but a shared sense of patriotism and purpose and community, we have to delineate clear limits and enforce them. So I would say, let this be where we start. Let us define as completely beyond the pale efforts to disregard millions of our neighbors' votes, to say that a few insiders know better than the people, and to hijack for the first time in history the state of Wisconsin's constitutional role in helping to choose the next president. We don't seek this accountability for partisan gain. We don't do it for personal preference. It is purely an exercise of fealty to the ideas and the ideals of American democracy. Let me leave you with a quote from President George W. Bush's first inaugural. We are bound by ideals, he said, that teach us what it means to be citizens. Every child must be taught these ideals and every citizen must uphold them. That's our goal. That's the work we're doing. And I really thank you for letting me speak about it. Thank you, Jeff, for your incredibly insightful presentation. The extent of your expertise and impact are truly remarkable. We are indeed fortunate to have a brilliant mensch like you in Wisconsin with us. We will be turning now to the question and answer portion of the program. Listener participants, please use the chat function to direct your questions to Tamar and myself, and we'll do our best to pass them on to Jeff. We'll start off, Jeff, with this question though first. We often hear that Wisconsin has become a testing ground for challenges to democracy. Why and how did this happen? It's a great question. Um, I would submit to you that Wisconsin is not just a testing ground, but the preeminent testing ground in Wisconsin for challenges to democracy. And I would submit to you that it is, um, it is Dafka because it's Wisconsin. Dafka is one of those words that there's not really a good translation, right? It's because it's Wisconsin specifically. And why? What, what do I mean by that? I said earlier that Wisconsin is a place where we have close elections. Wisconsin's also a place where historically we have a lot of different ideas. This is the state that birthed the populist movement and fighting Bob La Follette. It's also the state that brought us Joe McCarthy. This is the state that elects Tammy Baldwin one of the most liberal senators in the United States Senate and the first openly gay or lesbian senator in history, and also elects Ron Johnson, one of the most conservative senators in America, and does so at the same time and repeatedly, right? So it's a fascinating place. It's a study in contrasts. And what that's led to, in some states where there are real differences of opinion, what you get is sort of a mushy middle, but that's not what we've had in Wisconsin. We've traditionally had dueling extremes. And because of that, just as Louis Brandeis used to talk about the states as laboratories of democracy, uh, sort of the venture capital idea of how our federal government worked, that we would let all these little state startups try things and see what worked and we'd bring the best ones to Washington. Wisconsin over the last century, until maybe 15 years ago, was the most thriving, successful laboratory of democracy in the United States. Whatever kind, so many policy innovations came out of Wisconsin, regardless of what your policy preferences or your ideological prior commitments are. Unemployment insurance, social security, school choice, a tremendous amount of, 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 of the gun rights movement came out of Wisconsin. Um, uh, uh, nonpartisan nominating commissions so that federal jobs don't just go to people who happen to be friends with a senator or the president, but that there's a meritocracy, open government, voter ID, all of these things were ideas that came out of and were tested in Wisconsin and went and got bigger. And it is because Wisconsin has had this success as an incubator of policy, I think, because it is such a model of democracy, that it is under attack. 
Thank you. Um, another question that has come in. Politics has always been a dirty business. Partisans on all sides look for any advantage, and they often push boundaries of the rules to do so. Isn't this just an example of one side trying a sharp tactic that was ultimately unsuccessful and therefore harmless? I think that it can be tempting. We all want to get along. We all um, like and respect our neighbors, our friends, our family members who might have different political ideas than we do. And I think it is tempting to sort of brush this particular fraudulent elector issue under the rug as part of that. But I don't think that we can, and I don't think we should. It is quite different to push the boundaries. It is quite different to find a loophole in a campaign finance rule or to do something novel and maybe questionable in terms of turning out people to vote, then it is to say, as the fraudulent electors did, I simply don't care what all the other people, 3.3 million of them in my state chose. I know better and I will impose my will. That is far, far different than what a campaign might do um, you know, to make sure that it gets a slight or try to get a slight edge one place or another. This is not a difference of degree. This is a difference in kind. And that's why I say this is where we have to draw the line. Switching gears a, a bit to um, voter rights concerns. It seems like ongoing voter suppression efforts in Wisconsin and elsewhere disproportionately target the elderly, the disabled, and minorities amongst us. Why is that? Um, well, I think there are a bunch of reasons. Uh, I think one is that there's a sense that those are folks who might be more easily dissuaded from voting. I think that the more you tighten the rules, the harder it is for people who have um, less ready access to instant information, less flexibility to get to the polls or to change where they're voting or to change how they're voting. Um, those are all pieces of it. Those, those communities you mentioned are also communities that disproportionately vote by absentee ballot. And the whole concept of voting absentee has become extremely controversial. When I listed, by the way, some earlier policy innovations that came out of Washington and spread, that came out of Wisconsin and spread around the country, um, no, no excuse absentee voting is one of those. Wisconsin was one of the first states to say that anyone who preferred to vote absentee should be able to. Uh, but we're seeing a retrenchment against the idea of absentee voting. We're seeing a retrenchment against the idea that, that everyone who is eligible to vote should. And I think that's, that's really dangerous um, without in any way diminishing the fights that we had during the civil rights era about whether African-Americans could vote or some of the, 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 the debates we had about women voting. By the way, Wisconsin, once again, innovating, first state to uh, ratify the 19th Amendment. Um, we always had an axiomatic agreement in this country that for the most part, everybody who was eligible to vote should, we wanted participation. Now, there were people who didn't want some people to be eligible to vote. I'm not denying that. But everyone who was eligible to participate, we wanted to participate. We wanted to include everyone's voices. And all of a sudden in the last 10 years or so, that common understanding is not so common. And that's dangerous and deleterious to our democracy. Thank you. Um, we've heard, you know, a lot of, of things about what's going on from you. Um, what can we do? What can, as individuals, we do to um, help safeguard democracy? I think one of the things we can do is we can share our common commitment to democracy. We can say as part of our Jewish values, going back to where we started tonight, that we will not stand idly by. 
as others assault our democracy or demean or undermine it. We can say whatever our political views, and it can be useful to pair this with the fact that you don't have the same political views as everyone else, that democracy matters. Democracy is a common ground that is one level more foundational to our governance and our politics and our country than are our political differences. You can go further. You can challenge those who attack our democracy. You can thank officials who support democracy. That doesn't have to be partisan. It can be if you feel strongly about certain officials who are, are supporting democracy, but it doesn't have to be. You can thank election administrators. Wisconsin has local election administration. Many, many of us don't realize this, but in most states, elections are run at the state level or at the county level, but not in Wisconsin. Our elections are run at the municipal level. So if you live in the city of Milwaukee, your elections are run by the city. If you live in one of the villages in the suburbs, your elections are run by that village, by that clerk. And almost all of those positions are nonpartisan. Those are officials who work really hard. One out of every six election officials in the entire country, one out of every six is here in Wisconsin because we're the only state that runs elections on such a local level. We have a tremendous number of election administrators and you can thank them because it's a hard and important job and they are under tremendous scrutiny and pressure. You can press public officials to do more to protect and advance democracy. You can support organizations that advance democracy, civic education, and civil discourse. There are many, Law Forward's not alone. And I would suggest to you that with all of these things, we have a special obligation here in Wisconsin. As we already discussed, Wisconsin's the testing ground for some of the most extreme challenges to democracy in this country. Those challenges as they start here, are exported. Just like policy innovations have been exported from democracy elsewhere, the challenges to democracy, when they work here, when they almost work here, when they almost get away with it, those things are being exported and we're seeing them in other states. And so we in Wisconsin have a special obligation. We very much are our brother's keepers for American democracy. And this brings me all back really to where I started. All of us, all of us have a duty to stand up and say what we care about and do our part, not the whole work, but our part to protect democracy. And it's particularly true for those of us in Wisconsin. And I, I would suggest for some of the reasons that were discussed by Miriam and Joan earlier, it is particularly true for those of us in the Jewish community. Thank you so much. And thank you again to the Edelman family and to the Federation. It was a real privilege to speak to you tonight. Thanks very much, Jeff. We're gonna turn the baton back over to Diane for some closing remarks. Thank you, Jeff. Wow, what an evening. So much energy, so much information and so much to be aware of. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us tonight and for sharing your words and your wisdom and for helping us to become more inquisitive and better informed. Jeff has generously agreed to be available for follow-up questions. You can reach out to him via email at jmandel at lawforward.org. We did pop that into the chat. Thank you all for joining us tonight together we help to make up our Milwaukee Jewish community. And as we heard tonight, it is our responsibility to support each other, listen to each other and learn from each other. We are always stronger together. First, I wanna thank Edie Edelman and the Edelman family for having the vision and the dedication to invest in our community with the Edie Edelman Endowment Fund, ensuring that women's philanthropy will be able to continue to deliver political awareness to our community. I also wanna thank everyone who helped make this evening possible. Thank you to our inspiring co-chairs, Jody haber and Tamar Kelber. Thank you to our dedicated leadership, Cheryl Moser and Joan Lubar. Thank you, Miriam, our president and CEO for your guiding words. 
Thank you also to our behind the scenes support, Kate, Deb, and Tom. And thank you all for joining us. Good night.